Chris, welcome. It's good to have you here. I really appreciate you coming on. A pleasure, a pleasure. So maybe we could start off by you just introducing yourself a little bit, maybe give a bit of background about you so that people understand where you're coming from. We're going to be talking about language learning in general. I think we can apply a few things to English learning specifically because most of the people in my audience are English learners. But I would like to, if we have room to sort of get broader and talk about language learning, that would be great. But, but if you wouldn't mind just sort of telling us a little about yourself, that would be awesome. All right. Um, well, I'm. I'm. Uh, I guess I'm a, an author, uh, an entrepreneur, uh, an adventurer. Um, I'm uh, a permaculture designer. So a bunch of things. I, I uh, spent the first twenty-something years of my life in a little place called Belfast, um, south of the equator, down in New Zealand, and uh, not Belfast, Ireland. The other although, Belfast, yeah. Yeah, the Bel well, there are many of them, but, but it was actually a town full of Irish people. Um, and um, in 1981, I went to China, um, and I have spent since then basically in China, Hong Kong, and more recently in uh, some other places in Southeast Asia. Um, I've gone to the North Pole. As part of an expedition, I've um, I'm trained as a I'm a master trainer in, in neurolinguistic programming. My first degree at university was psychology, but that covered everything from biological psychology to mathematical psychology, social psych. So I did the the whole gamut. Um, and um, for the last 10, 12 years, I've been working on developing and. I'm selling a, a product for mainland Chinese people to learn English. It's called Kung Fu English. Um, that was on the base back of a book I wrote in 2006, which was uh, How to Learn Any Language. In, uh, sorry, it's called uh, The Third Ear. You Can Learn Any Language. So, um, the book's called The Third Ear, right? The, the Third Ear. Yeah, yeah, one, two, three ears, okay. um, which is actually uh, a really key element of, of learning a language um, to understand that 85% or more of communication is through the body. Um, and so our body is in fact an ear in many ways. Uh, we pick up vibration, we respond kinesthetically to, to what's going on in rhythm with the people we're communicating with. There's a whole lot going on in body language that has, has been researched for, for many, many years. So that, that helps in the language learning process actually. Well, I've, I've seen your, your TED talk which yeah. has a lot of views for sure. It's a great talk, and I would encourage you guys watching this to to check out that talk. But um, it it seemed like uh, maybe the the third ear concept we can flesh out a little bit later because I'm curious about that. If I could ask just quickly, what is neurolinguistic programming? I'm actually not familiar with what that is. Okay, neurolinguistic programming was developed. Um, I guess in the early 70s, I'm trying to remember, um, two guys, John John Grinder and Richard Bandler, um, developed it. Uh, Bandler was a, was a computer scientist, um, Grinder was a linguist, and they were challenged by Gregory Bateson, who is, was the husband of Margaret Mead, anthropologist, so basically leading edge thinkers, to look at psychology and try to define a new paradigm for it. Um, and they came at it uh, by modeling three very, very effective psychotherapists. One was Fritz Perls, uh, who was a Gestalt therapist. One was Virginia Satir, who was a family therapist. And one was Milton Erickson, who arguably um, is what, what was the world's greatest hypnotherapist. And so they pulled together a model of how you use language um, and how does the, the mind-body system work and how can you literally go in and reprogram it. So you can, you can take a phobia, right? Um, phobia that someone's had for 10 years and you can literally clear that in 10 minutes. Um, there's, Is there an there's application a lot for, for language learning that involves hypnosis? Or anything like it? Uh, an it well, um, I, I missed half of the question. You dropped out, but you're saying, is there an application for language learning that uses these ideas? Especially, yes. And I, I actually specifically mentioned hypnosis, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is yes. We build a little bit of that into Kung Fu English. Um. But but the 
the essence, the real essence is to understand that a lot of how we respond in life is automatic programs that are, that are running through our neurology and that you can literally go in and you can use language, you can use movement. There's, there's a bunch of ways to do this, but you can, you can find that, that particular little algorithm that is causing you problems and you can edit it out. You can change it. Right. So, you know, you know, a real classic one is people who get terrified when a teacher asks them a question. There's a, there's a process that you can use to help them just essentially shift their internal perspective on what's going on and the fear disappears. So, um, Is that a it's, principle it's, that can be learned or is that something that has to be systematically practiced in order to sort of sidestep that? Because that's a huge issue for language learners, particularly – I would say in Asia and places like mm. Japan, but you know it, it's definitely there around the world. People fear speaking because they don't want to make a mistake, right? Is there a way to sort of give people a principle that they can sort of start the process on their own, or is that something that well, they the have real to get the through practice? Ah, uh, well, it depends what's going on. Some, you know, there's, there's a couple of levels to this. One is you have um, basic just fear of losing face which is sort of mild but then you you literally have people who have phobias um and and these phobias have been created through the education system or through parents so basically um someone trying to to say something if they get a frown back or it looks like they're going to be criticized it literally triggers a mild form of post-traumatic stress Right. So you get PTSD. So so they go into PTSD brain PTSD from speaking English, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it That's literally, fascinating. Uh, you, you have people who will go into a cold sweat. They will blanch. Right. Their brain will go blank. Literally, this is a phobic response. And it's it's a mild form of PTSD. And if, if, if somebody has been criticized very badly in front of their peers in a classroom bomb, you could have that basically is a scar that, that goes through life with you. Right. Um, and it's, it's easy to fix, but still most people are not aware that this stuff is doable and how to go about doing it. So to, to answer your question, is understanding the principle enough? For some people, yes. For others, you actually need some specific tools. Okay. And these are, these are linguistic tools. These are mental model tools. Um, sometimes you, you can do it by yourself. Sometimes you can do it through guided processes on audio. Sometimes you need a real life coach to, to be in a space with you to, to walk you through. Because what tends to happen is that the problem issues are unconscious. So someone working with you can spot when something's happening and pin you on it and can deal with it at that point if you're de trying to deal with it yourself you tend to uh either become unconscious literally <laughs> just go to sleep or you jump over it or whatever you don't recognize it for what it is so it's it's it's, it's fascinating in fact uh, yeah I, I found a lot of a lot of parallels to the auto shop in terms i mean i've been teaching languages for for eight or nine years and okay it's not a bad way to look at yourself in terms of how you sort of overcome certain barriers that are in your way N nobody's a car and it's it can be a little embarrassing to think <laughs> of yourself in sort of a mechanical sense but if you do you're able to look at things a little bit more objectively i've, I've certainly noticed that in a lot of a lot of learners mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And when you can look at yourself objectively, you just go, okay, well, that pattern's not working for yeah. me. And if, if I keep repeating that, I'm going to get the same result. So what do I do different? And sometimes the answer is anything. Right. You just, yes, just, yes. just whatever, what, whatever you've been doing, stop it, do something different. What you do different may not work, but it breaks the pattern. So uh, and once you've, once you've broken the pattern, you get many, many more degrees of freedom of what you can do. Well, that's a principle right there. I think you just said it. There's a, break the absolutely, pattern. There's, there you go. Yeah, break, break the pattern. Exactly. Uh, now, you, you also are a language learner, so I'm just wondering if you could give a make a case for it, if it's sort of an elevator pitch for learning languages. <laughs> I'm from I'm from the United States. It's not there's not really a focus here, right? Uh, People need inspiration. They they like to see examples of people who have gone through this process and how it benefits them. So, what would be your your pitch for why people should actually study 
more than one language or learn more than their mother tongue? Well, those are those are probably a couple of questions. Let, but let, let's yeah. let's yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm I'm uh, infamous for asking uh, compound questions, and I should have should have apologized in advance. No, 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 that's fine. All right. So the first question, the first question is, uh, as a language learner, you know, how would I help people learn a language? You know, what 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 would I say that would help them be successful learning a language? Okay. Uh, all I can say is I have learned several languages. Uh, at the same time, every single person on the planet is a language learner. And every single person on the planet has learned a language to high levels of proficiency without being taught it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We come into this world naked and mute. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> so you came in in a three-piece suit. That's hey. right. That's exactly right. <laughs> you might have been noisy, but you certainly couldn't couldn't be very specific with logical explanations of what you were thinking. So we've all learned a language, right? So so fundamentally, all we need to do is to remember how we went through that process and be prepared to repeat it. Um, yeah. so, so that sort of is, 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 is the real simple elevator pitch, right? Um, in terms of myself, I, I've had experiences of being utterly terrible when trying to learn language and being really fine. And my first experience of that was when I was at school trying to learn French. I was like in the bottom quarter of the class and just, it was terrible. And then there was this um, student exchange program between New Zealand and Tahiti. Mm -hmm. So Tahiti, French colony in the middle of the South Pacific, lovely place. And, um, and so I, uh, I had this guy come and live with us for two weeks, no, sorry, two months. And um, he was a real pain in the butt, but we had a lot of fun and we ended up spending a lot of time using French as a, as a medium of communication. He was supposed to come and be, be immersing himself in English, but when he was hanging out with me, he preferred French, so whatever. And then uh, at the end of the same year, I got to go to Tahiti and spend six weeks living with him and his family. Mm -hmm. And basically that two months with him in my place and the six weeks living in his house with his family, um, my I didn't need to do another minute of work on my French for the next two years until the end of high school. Um, I got A-plus grades and I was like a second place winner in a national French speaking competition. So that was that was my first experience. That was the difference between using the language as a tool to communicate um, and trying to learn it as a subject of study. So uh, I never really I wasn't able to articulate it at the time. I then went on to university. I tried Russian. That was a complete waste of time. I then went on and um, did tried to do some Chinese. Um, that was a complete waste of time. Um, the teacher was somebody who would talk in a monotone and tell us all to open the books to page 27, and now we're going to practice them forms. i tell you, I had a 4 p.m. lecture in zoology, and I was brain dead every single time before I got to it. <laughs> it was so bad. It was so bad. It was so bad. And then I went to China in 1981, and um, I set myself the goal to be speaking Chinese to the level of a native. Um, and I was lucky. I, I, I lucked on to a bunch of things. I ended up finding some, some lan language parents. Mm -hmm. who would interact with me as a parent would interact with a child. Um, I was able to learn a whole lot through um, teaching Taekwondo. So I, I had to teach local people Taekwondo. I couldn't speak any Mandarin. So I was learning how to talk about 
parts of the body, stances, movements, um, so very physically locked in the body. And this is another thing. If you look at what children do, they lock learning into their body from a very, very young age. They hear it, they understand it, they respond to it, they can't speak. So these are all stages that we need to go through as a, as a learner learning our first language. We actually have to repeat the same stages when we're learning as an adult. Um, so basically six months in, I was fluent to the level of probably, I don't know, an eight, 10 year old child, maybe a bit, bit more, was able to travel around China completely unhindered. Um, and then I started to dig into reading a book cover to cover and spent a lot of time with a, another language parent who would read to me, who would explain some of the cultural stuff. Well, everything is cultural. So there was a whole bunch of stuff, which just, linguistically didn't make sense because it was a Chinese way of thinking right. metaphorically and I needed to have the metaphors explained to me. But once I got the hang of that, I then noticed that everything in language is metaphor. I mean, absolutely everything. <laughs> Ballpark yeah. figure, you know, keep me posted. All these things are, are metaphors, right? Yeah, Clutching we, live onto... in a, in a, we live in a landscape of metaphors. Yeah, exactly. You know, clutching, clutching onto straws, right? That's a metaphor. Almost everything we say is is a metaphor. Even even the way certain words are structured to sound like what it is they're describing, it's all it's all metaphorical. So that as an insight is really really important for a language learner. But we don't um, have the memory of it when we go through it the first time, and I think that's probably the disconnect, right? So it seems like I mean, exactly. really, really, I think the two the two things you're you're talking about are not only immersion but application of language in the context that it's supposed to be used in and and going back and learning as a child meaning you're you're not only immersed but you're integrating it physically you're actually doing the language rather than just learning it like a subject yeah you definitely you're doing the language i wouldn't say you necessarily need to be immersed because you look at all these people who travel live in another country 10 20 years surrounded by the language they're immersed but they learn zip um, they, they, right. they shut their brain down. Much, much more importantly is you're engaged in communication and the context of that communication is so that you will understand what's happening as it happens. So how can, um, how can people get that though without the immersion part of it? Like a lot of people who want to learn a language say, well, yeah, that would be nice, but I can't I can't go to America for six months or, or I can't go to the UK or New Zealand for six months to do that. I can't go to Tahiti, whatever it is. How do you how do you simulate that and have those uh, those points of contact and that regular communication without it? OK, well, for a start, early days learning a language, if you look at what a child does, it's all passive. It's just listening to everything that's going on and observing. Right. And then and then you go through a process of starting to label things. Right. So. So, you know, what's this? <laughs> All right. What, what 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 is this? Right. And so you, you actually look at little kids and they, they'll go around labeling things. Um, so the initial phase of the language learning process actually needs to include a massive amount of listening just to hear the sounds of the language over and over and over again. And I've called that brain soaking. So you just put yourself in a situation where you allow your brain just to hear all the sounds and it will go from complete mush. Literally, you're not hearing the sounds clearly until slowly you start to hear everything clearly. And that is because in our brain, there's actually, in our audio system, the, the auditory system, there are filters that filter out sounds that are not part of the languages that we're familiar with. So you actually have to basically um, crack the auditory system and open it up so it hears more sounds. Do you know if we can get all the way there? I've heard that it's something like the basic phonemes of our language get kind of locked in at the na full native level before age two or something like that. Is there validity to that or, or can we do it at, can we fully do it at any age? Do you believe people can well, become I, completely fluent? Um, put it this way, um, people mistake me for a native Chinese okay. until they see me, until they see me. And, and a really interesting phenomenon, uh, you'll love this. I will meet someone for the first time. We're speaking Chinese, 
and they this person will say to me wow your english is really good i'm serious <laughs> <laughs> so oh wow <laughs> so, so that's interesting yeah yeah i get it yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So, so, so what's happened is they have started to say your Chinese is really good. They have subconsciously gone, you cannot say that to a Chinese person. That's insulting. Right. And they switch it to English. And this has not just happened once. This has happened, I would say, 50, 60 percent of the time where I meet somebody new. Yes. I was I was in. On meet a new person <laughs> uh, on the phone on the phone they, they won't say that because i had a situation in hong kong where i spent th several weeks every day on the phone to the secretary of a client preparing for uh, for an event yeah. many years ago now and the, the whole time it was cantonese the whole yeah. time and then we met for the first time physically and she tried to say something to me and she was like her mouth was opening and closing like a fish because her brain was saying Chinese. He, he speaks Chinese. Her eyes were saying, I got to speak English. Right. And she, she, she just had this massive gridlock in her brain and it stopped her from talking. Deer in the so, headlights moment. Deer in the headlights moment. Yeah, yeah. So, so I had many, many, many experiences like that. So it's, it's, it's very clear to me. I know other people. I, as the guy, a uh, good friend of mine, consultant who lived and worked in Japan for years, and his Japanese pronunciation, rhythm, usage, everything was native level. And he would play with taxi drivers. He would take taxi rides and he would sit in the back, but out of view of the mirror and he would hold detailed conversations with these guys in Japanese and then when it was time to, to pay he would get out walk around the front and pay from the outside so he could he could see the taxi right. driver's reaction right and every single time it was like what this is not possible you're a gaijin you know <laughs> gaijin there, don't speak like that there are whole youtube uh, channels sort of based on that premise of of shocking people with uh, language skills it's a sort of uh, a trend uh, I, exactly. I wanted to ask specifically about uh one issue that a lot of well english learners of course but i think i would imagine language learners in general where you, you get this tendency to, to memorize words, but then there is sort of a, a gap when it comes to usage. So, okay, I've learned, I've learned my 25,000 words, I've got my vocabulary lists, but then when it comes to actually having a conversation, I don't remember any of them. I don't know how to use any of them. So do, uh, do you have a, a, an approach that you recommend for, for people struggling with that? I know a lot of English learners certainly do. Okay, yeah. Stop learning word lists. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Fundamentally. yeah, sure. So stop learning, le learning word lists, all right? This sort of goes back to your question just before. Um, the way to get the brain doing what it does with your mother tongue is to go through the process or a, a, a facsimile of the process that you went through as a child learning your mother tongue, okay? So that, that's, that's the first thing. Kids don't learn word lists when they're trying to, to learn their mother tongue. You just don't do it. Um, so what's happening when people are learning word lists is they're basically doing a translation. Okay, the, the native tongue word is this. The matching translation is that. The trouble is there could be 10 different possible meanings for that matching translation. Right. All right. So, so it could translate to 10 different English words. Well, you and... said the word post earlier. You, that has all kinds of meanings. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, the, the, so the issue really is, and, and even if, if you start to really get into it, yes, it has many, many meanings, but for most of those, you can also find the metaphorical link back to a physical under uh, so substrate, okay? There's a, there's a physical situation which led to the creation of the first use of the word probably and then others are derivatives of that at, at higher and higher levels of abstraction is I, is I think what happens. Um, then of course the same sound, different people in different places at different times could have used it to mean different things. So it ends up being two different meanings for the same word, right? So the, right. there's a whole etymology. Etymology? 
and the whole etiology of, of language, right? Okay, so learning word lists just is not the way to go. Uh, what most people don't realize is that there's 1,000 very, very high frequency words that cover 85% of anything you'll ever need. If you listen to people speaking your, your mother tongue on a daily basis, the number of words used is very, very, very limited. Very limited. Depends on who your friends but, are. No, no, but, but no, just in terms point. of I'm joking. Right? I get your point. Husbands and husbands and wives. How much do they actually say to each other? Wash the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wash wash the dishes. Where are you going? Come back early. Don't be late. <laughs> yeah. Who are you texting? <laughs> exactly. Right. I mean, there's this there's a very 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 narrow limit of what people say to each other on a daily basis. If you get to three thousand words. You're covering 98% of anything you're going to need in life and business. Yeah. So w w the, the, the trick is not to wor learn word lists because you're essentially creating a, a subsidiary link. You've got a neural network in your brain for your mother tongue. With You've got images and feelings and past experiences and all that is connected to the language. And what you're doing by learning a word list is you've sort of got a very, very, very feeble connection to this sound and maybe the spelling of something from a different neural network that yeah. you're trying to plug into your original network. And it just does not work. That's why I, I – yeah, that's why I tell people never use – unless you absolutely – are in a rush never use a by language dictionary because as soon as you bring up that english word you're bringing up with it this very heavy architecture of the meaning in your language which is completely different it has a as exactly. you said, different etymology exactly. a different context completely exactly so what you need to do is you start with this is like a hundred words yeah that will make you communicative i call them glue words Right, you've got your basic logical components and but, okay, this, then that. You, you've got there, here, okay. Um, you've got colors, you've got numbers. Um, th yeah, the the the, the 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 word that you can use to co to cover almost everything is that. Yeah, right. Sure, that works. Yeah, give me that. <laughs> <laughs> give me that. Give me that. I want that. All right. So, so you look at a little kid, right? They'll pick one word that has massive functionality, which means they can use it to make stuff happen in their life. <laughs> and they overuse it until such time as they go, okay, that's cool, but that's not enough. And then they expand from that. Okay. You, you, you need to go around labeling things, right, in the new language. So you see a TV and you go, you see a car and you go, you see a really gorgeous looking person and then you go, wow, right? So you, you, you are taking these experiences in your life and you're labeling them with a new label system. Because mm -hmm. that's all language is. It's a labeling system for our internal experience. Um, in, in NLP, which we talked about before, you've got representation systems. So you, you, you've got visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and we actually represent the world through those multiple sensory systems inside our mind body, and then we add language to it as a label system. And really the difference in what you're saying is it's in, instead of just learning the label system as these isolated pieces, it's learning the label system as interaction, as a, the medium it's, of interaction. <laughs> Well, it's learning it as the medium of, in, of interaction, but it's also using it as, as understanding that it's a labeling system. Right. See, mono, monolingual people, I think, grow up believing that the sound of the word is the thing. Mm. But people who grow up in a multilingual environment, this is why we're in Malaysia at the moment with our call center here, is that they know intuitively that it's multiple label systems for the same underlying stuff. Right. Right, right. All right. So, so just getting that in your head. Look, this is just a completely different labeling system, and I'm just learning this new system to label everything that I have inside me. All right, including my perceptions of color, or my perceptions of sound, all that stuff. So, just m making that shift in understanding of what you're doing helps immensely. 
okay and then and then you basically are trying to learn the code to put these different chunks together in ways that will allow you to express what it is that you have going on inside so now you ultimately you need somebody to be interacting with you um, and you're using the language as a tool so if you're not going to be using it as a tool there's probably no point learning it right the whole purpose of language is to communicate with other people all right so you don't just learn it to have have a feather in your cap you should be learning it because you want to be using it right and then and then you want to find people who will interact with you as a parent would with a child until the point you get to peer to peer does and that then, solve then the works. motivation problem as well because the other big problem is for, i mean for the academic style of learning language i'm really excited about learning it lasts a couple of weeks then it dies and i go on to something else i start learning tennis or something like that does that sort of the interactive nature of it or having a peer or having some external accountability does that solve the motivation problem or there is that is that too simple or is it just you? Does it have to be you're that type of person? You're you're either a motivated no, think, person or you're not. Well, yeah, some people are just not motivated. I I, I would say you know, if I if I was to be brutal and overly Please. general and overly generalistic, I would say the academic system in and of itself does not do justice to what is required. I mean, it's just that it's 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 a grammar translation method, pretty much going back a couple of hundred years and it has not generated linguists. Basically, you know, if this methodology worked, every single person on the planet would be bilingual, multilingual. Right, because we all take at least Spanish or French in high school, but nobody ah. ever leaves knowing how to speak it, right? It's a it, good exactly. point, and it's kind of odd that it's gone on so long with such a such a terrible success rate. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, the whole thing about, you know, it's like if, if you absolutely want to understand a new field of learning, um, say it could be martial arts or it could be some, some arm of science or it could be some aspect of a culture and it's really only richly expressed in that language, then you're going to find somebody who's going to basically take you through the ba the really really basic stuff and communicate with you, um, so you understand. They're not going to correct your grammar. They're not going to tell you your pronunciation is wrong. They're going to hear you and they're going to understand you, and then they're going to fill in for clarity and confirmation of that understanding. So um, I call that language parenting. Um, I was really lucky. I, I ended up sitting down with a guy who was a painter in Beijing back in the day. And we would go out for dinner or I'd go to his place and he'd, you know, pour tea and we'd just hang out for like right. two, three hours, you know, almost every day. And he would be talking and I would be listening and I wouldn't understand most of it. And then I'd understand a bit more and then I'd understand a little bit more. Um, and then I would say stuff and he would go, Oh, what? Oh, you mean this? And, and so that right. was, that was how I was introduced to this idea of so language bump, parenting. Bumping um, against things really rounds out the corners a little bit. But uh, I mean, indeed. what you're saying, the sort of interactive nature, one thing that I've recommended to people, if they want to see it, if they want to look at an, a good example, I recommend, I don't know if you ever saw it, I think it's from the 70s, an old TV miniseries called Shogun. Uh, it's a, he's a Dutch trader and he ends up in Japan. His sort of process of learning the language is, and they sort of, they, they don't do subs or anything. He, he learns it as he goes. It's, it's a fascinating sort of story. And I sort of tell people, look at this, look how he did it. And just imagine you're this guy lost in this country and you've got to figure it out or you'll die. Uh, you figure it out. Yeah. You yeah. figure it out. There, there, there was a British soldier who got left behind in Guangdong province after the end of the Second World War. And they found him in the mid 80s, I think. And he was a fluent Cantonese speaker. And he had forgotten his English. He forgot. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. That's that's an exceptional case. I know. I lost about fifty percent of my English in my first three years in China. I think your English is is great. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. People say that. I, I can change it a little bit for you if you like. And just, we can... <laughs> whatever, whatever you want to give me, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with it. So my, well, I, I sort of have a, a two part last, last question. Okay. Uh, number one is, I know it can be a little misleading to focus too much on tools, right? But are there any tools that can really help that people should know about that they don't know about if not cool and then uh if that applies to for example your book the third ear if you want to talk about that and and maybe people can pick that up or oh, work kung fu english I'd, I'd like to hear more about that as well all right let's talk about the book first because I'm, I'm assuming that your listeners are from many many different countries mm -hmm. um the third year um after I wrote it, a bunch of people started to buy it, read it, and use it. Um, and so, for instance, a girl from Australia who'd been in Holland for a couple of years failed miserably at learning Dutch. She read the book, took herself to Brazil, just applied the ideas, and she was fluent in Portuguese in six months, got a job as head of diversity with ABN AMRO in Brazil. Um, a whole bunch of people took it, went to China, basically applied the ideas and were fluent in Chinese in six months. They were literate, able to deal with legal contracts in about a year. Um, so the ideas in there, if you, if you want to go in country, I would say there's no better guide on the planet than that as to how you need to go about the so language. sort of on the ground guide. It's an on-the-ground guide. Now, I share a lot of stories about my time in China in the 80s. I have stories from, from business, um, a lot of stuff around the communication process more generally. But the ideas in there, really, if you apply them, they're going to make a very, very big difference to your life. Um, and this is where the, the, our, our, slow, our slogan, you know, learn any language in six months, comes from. Because the average time... For people using these ideas in situ in the in the environment was six months to fluency. Okay. Yeah. All right. It wasn't wasn't it wasn't just one person and and this was a whole bunch of people who had literally failed learning a second language who went and had another try. Okay. So it was it was a fundamentally different proposition. Now, um, Kung Fu English is I guess the evolution of that, um, and it sort of answers some of the, the questions you were saying before. What happens if you can't travel? If you if you're stuck in country? What do you do? So Kung Fu English is a self learning system for for basically for Mandarin speakers to learn English. It's it's um, on iOS, and it's a uh, it's it's courseware with massive amounts of content, audio, video, everything else, ga gamification, and it takes you step by step through the learning process, basically as a child. So the so, premise is you're a baby. Let's let's go through it. The premise is you're a baby. Let's go through it. So you know the first day. You, you get into brain soaking. So every single day you're brain soaking for about half an hour. We uh, put in uh, the first, we use a lot of music. So like nursery rhymes, we use rhythm, rhythm and music. And we match stuff, um, mother tongue target, mother tongue target. So in, for them, it's Mandarin first and then, and then uh, English. And all the way through, we use this principle of comprehensible input. The basic idea, this has been researched over and over again, this very clear principle, that if you understand the message, even if you don't have the words, if you understand the message, you will acquire the language. That, very, that, very important. It does, but that does flip sort of – flips the paradigm a little bit, right? Because yeah, yeah. we've always seen it as – from the bottom up, I have to learn this language, and then, oh boy, I can start communicating. No, After, exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Right. No, no, you're, you're communicating from day one. So the first phrase you should learn in your new language is, how do you say this? Right, right. So you hold up a spoon and you go, how do you say this? So you, you're using the language to inquire about the language, and that, I think, does something fundamental. It tells your brain one, I'm serious. Two, this is a tool and I can get outcomes by using this tool. So that, and when you ask and they give you the answer, 
then you get your your reinforcement and your reward. Okay, we we've built the this whole process of hearing commands like a parent to a child: open your mouth, sit down, come here. We've built that in, so people hear a command and they have a whole bunch of images that they have to pick from, and we encourage them to actually physically move their body to respond to the command, and send back videos of of themselves That's doing it. Cool. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, so 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 we've we've as much as possible we've made it interactive. We've made it re- sort of a facsimile of of how children learn, and then on the back end we get into basically the core course material is the third year, and they get to read it end to end in English. Like when I I read that book with the old guy who was was reading it out to me loud. So we have audio book and we have tons of visuals that link to the the sounds we through the through the um, lexical chunking of the language you actually absorb the grammar without having to think about it the grammar is also built into the what we call l to b language to body will there uh, be will there be a, a, an international rollout of that program at, at some point do you think well uh, Kung Fu English is available globally for people who speak Mandarin and right. who want to learn want to learn English um, we definitely would love to take it and rebuild it and repurpose it for other languages um, whether when we do that is going to be a function of when we have the resources to do it right right, right? so but, but but if there are people out there who are really keen with with something like this, absolutely, we could we could have a conversation about, you know, how would we bring this into other language groups? Well, I'm I'm keen to pick up the book and read it. You've you've got me very <laughs> curious about the book. I'll I'll grab it. It's on Amazon, I assume, right? It's on Amazon, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate all of the insights. Uh, My pleasure. Again, it's been it's been great. If you guys out there are Mandarin speakers, check out Gong Fu English, and otherwise, find a copy of The Third Ear. This is the whole title, right? Exactly. Like Chris the, 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 so the, check that the, out. The, the subtitle is uh, You Can Learn Any Language, so The okay, Third cool. Ear, You Can right. Learn any, any Language. We'll pop, that, we'll pop that link up in the description as well. Thanks so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. Awesome. A real pleasure. Yeah. Likewise.